Okay, well, you want to bring us to our first slide? Okay. So Zoom technical difficulties aside, we wanted to start by just giving everyone a huge thank you. We know this is a very uh, tricky time of year to gather and we so appreciate that everyone uh, took this time to come and discuss the future of Arcata with us and look for ways to collaborate uh, and care for the community that we all know and love. Uh, we also wanted to let you know about a couple of other upcoming opportunities to engage with us this month. There will be additional hearings and town halls throughout 2022 on this draft as it goes towards adoption, but we will be having a couple of walking tours on Saturday. Uh, one leaving City Hall at 11 and one leaving City Hall at noon. There will very likely be rain, so bring your galoshes. There will also be a planning commission meeting next week on the 14th uh, and a city council meeting the following day on the 15th. And those will start at 6 p.m. And the intent of those meetings uh, is purely to answer questions from the city council and the planning commission and begin to start the conversation on the draft and how to move forward with refining it. So I wanted to also run us through um, an introduction of the city team and consultant team before we get started so you know who's in the room and who you can uh, ask questions to. So we have three of our department heads at this meeting tonight. We have Emily Sinkhorn with Environmental Services, David Loya, my director with Community Development, and Natra Khatri with Engineering and Building. Uh, my name is Dilo Freitas. I'm here with other members of the Community Development team, Joe Matir, Sergio Berueta, and Gillen Martin, uh, who will be joining us for uh, some of our breakout sessions this evening. We also have a fair amount uh, of the members of our consultant team here with us tonight, including members of Plan West and GHD, uh, as well as Ben Noble, who will be uh, principally authoring our draft code that comes as a result of this plan once we have refined our vision as a community. So a couple of Zoom logistics, <laughs> always worth a refresher since it is a little bit finicky, obviously. Uh, we are recording this workshop. We ask that you please do mute when you are not speaking uh, and raise your hand to be called on. Uh, mostly that's just to eliminate any background noise and make sure everyone gets their chance to speak. Uh, press star nine on your phone if you're calling into this meeting, if you'd like to raise your hand. Uh, we were going to use the chat box to allow you to ask questions or get tech help. Uh, you may have noticed that the chat box is disabled for many of us tonight. I apologize for that. Um, but we will also be asking you to rename yourself, and I'll give you some guidance on that uh, momentarily, and that will help us uh, place you in different breakout groups when we begin our discussion. So for everyone, just a refresher on Zoom controls, when you go to rename yourself uh, or take on other functionality in Zoom, you go to the participants at the bottom screen, uh, click on participants, find yourself, and then click on more, and that will give you the functionality you need to rename yourself. And again, uh, please be patient with us, be patient with each other. We would have absolutely loved to be holding this meeting in person, uh, have the maps, be able to speak to one another in person. Um, but we have done what we can to try and make this a dynamic and fun meeting for everyone. And we're really excited that you're joining us tonight. So thank you uh, and apologize for technical difficulties that are inevitable. So uh, a little bit of an agenda before we get started. Uh, we are going to do a presentation of the draft plan. Uh, if you've read it, great. If you haven't, that's also great. We're going to give you a lot of information tonight. There's also a full overview video that's about an hour long that's available on our website for review. And then we'll be breaking up into uh, groups to discuss some of the main topics of the plan that we know people have questions uh, and ideas on. And then we will be doing report outs. Uh, we'll have a city staffer uh, in every breakout room. They'll be facilitating your conversation and another partnering uh, person will be taking notes. And then we will end with any questions from the group that weren't answered in the presentation.
Okay. So we wanted to do a poll to get a um, sense of who was in the room, um, but it looks as though um, my polling session is inactive. I'm not sure if that has to do with uh, our admin being on the other. I, I, I can start the polling, Dilo. It looks oh, like fabulous. I have a ability to do that. Thank you so much. Uh, so the first question is, should be active. At uh, this meeting, who are you representing? And circle your choice. Yeah, are folks seeing the polling question? Oh, no polling question. Not I happening. I'm seeing it just fine. I'm I see it just fine. <laughs> I see it. Well, if you see it, please take it. And if you don't see it, we apologize. <laughs> so the last poll question will be, um, can you see the poll? Hmm. Okay, they're still coming in pretty quick. So I think we'll, uh, we'll continue the poll for a minute here. Be a good test potentially of how many people have chat as well. I wonder if those functions are connected. Okay, I'm going to keep it open for just a moment longer. I have about 39 responses, about 60% participated. Okay, Sarah, go ahead. Um, polling works for me, but chat is disabled. Okay, thanks for that information. That's great news. Those aren't connected then. Okay, I'm going to, well, geez, we're still getting more people participating here. Okay, I'm going to call it. And I'll share the results. Somebody who can't chat and can't poll. Is there anyone like that in the room? It looks like. That's me. I cannot chat and I cannot poll. That's Jackie. So sorry, Jackie. That's okay. Um, can, you see, can you see the poll results? No, I can see a big white sign that says polling. Ah. Okay, well, we're going to stop. Stop sharing that. We'll move on. Sorry that didn't work for everyone. We'll we'll try and do better next time. Okay. So if anyone had come to our vision workshop earlier in the year, this will be uh, similar to what we did at that time. Uh, we are going to request that you pick one of these four groups that are identified here. Whichever one is um, most interesting to you based on what you came here tonight most excited to discuss. And we're going to ask you to rename yourself like this example below with the number of the group that you're most interested in, your name, if you have an organization that you're associated with, list that as well. Um, and then if you are uh, willing to do so, we ask that you add your pronouns to help us know um, how to address you. And uh, let us know if you have any issues with that. We also can um, work with you if you're left in the waiting room to manually assign you as well. So because we are um, going to be sort of assigning randomly after the first session, we're going to do our best to get you into the session that you want, but we're also going to attempt to evenly distribute uh, the participants between groups. So if it uh, comes to pass that you get to the third focus group and you still haven't gotten the topic that you had originally requested, feel free to pop back into the main session, leave your room and ask Crystal to reassign you. I find this really restrictive because I have a bird's eye view and I don't think that asking me to choose a breakout room 
is appropriate. All right, thanks for that feedback. Um, certainly, if you don't select uh, one of the breakout rooms, uh, you'll be assigned and then you'll get one of three at random. Um, uh, so hopefully they, they are the ones that, uh, that suit you. Okay, so, um, you know, and certainly if you want to email us and, and provide some feedback on, uh, you know, how we can uh, do better, uh, we'd, we'd certainly like to, to hear that. This is clearly a new, um, you know, new process for all of us, even though it's been the last two years. Um, I think that it's very clunky for most of us, and uh, we're always trying to improve. Um, we are uh, to, you know, get back to that point, hoping to sometime in the new year be able to do some in-person meetings um, on this topic, so there'll be uh, more time for that as well. Here's a question. Okay. Um, well, I'll tell you what, we're uh, on kind of a tight time budget. If it's you just have very, track. it's very quick. My name is Halima. I wanted to know if you're interested in the design of the streets, where do, which one of those groups do you go on? Okay. That's a good question. Dealer, can you explain a little bit more what's going to happen in each of these groups? Absolutely. Yeah. Thank you, Halima. So if you would like to talk about streets, you'll want to go to mobility, infrastructure, and streetscape. That's group three. Uh, if you want to talk more about parks uh, and open space, uh, arts or historic preservation, you would choose group four. Community amenities and design standards will be more about uh, the look, feel, and function of the structures and what we're hoping to build in to the plan to ensure that this remains a livable part of the city that we all uh, will continue to enjoy. And housing growth and development uh, will be similar, but focused more particularly on housing. Uh, and likely there will be some conversation about growth and development that will go beyond the boundaries of the gateway area as well. And we will have opportunity at the end um, for a Q&A with the entire group. So quick check in. Does that make sense to everyone? And we'll show those numbers again before you're required to break into them. Okay. Um, so yeah, my name is David Loy. I'm the Director of Community Development. Um, I've been involved in this effort since its uh, uh, initiation, since we started thinking about this conceptually. And I'm thrilled to be able to bring this project to you. Um, getting a little background noise. If you can mute, please. Appreciate it. Thrilled to be able to bring this, uh, this plan to you in this sort of inaugural uh, release uh, of this draft. And we've been looking forward to this plan for quite some time now. In some way, shape, or form, we've been working on it for about five years. Uh, but the rubber hits the road now. We actually have a plan that we can paw through, uh, flip through, and try and understand. So I really appreciate all of you taking the time out of your day to uh, come and talk with us about it, learn about the plan, and help us learn what's important to you uh, through this engagement. I'll be doing a big picture overview of the plan and explaining some of the key elements and how they'll work. Um, but this will be a uh, you know, somewhat high level overview. We'll dig into some of the detail in the subject matter areas in those breakout rooms. And then there are gonna be other opportunities, including the um, one hour video explaining the entire document that's currently on our YouTube channel or on our, our SIRP website, that's S-I-R-P. Arcata. If you Google that, you'll find us in the top hit. Just real quick before we get into uh, the detail, um, you know, I wanted to reiterate the engagement options. This is the first release. This is the first opportunity we've had to speak with the public about the document. Um, and then uh, this next Tuesday and Wednesday, the Planning Commission and City Council, respectively, will be uh, taking this item up at their meetings. And again, it'll be an opportunity to speak directly to the decision makers. Now, what are we doing with this engagement, all of this engagement? <clears throat> you know, we're coming and we're talking to people. We've been doing walking tours. We're hearing things. Sometimes we're writing them down. Sometimes we're not. We're pulling all this engagement together and providing that uh, a summary of what we're hearing to the council members. And so some folks can't come to the council meeting. Some folks, uh, you know, um, don't necessarily speak English as their first language. Um, so there's lots of things that we've been doing over the course of the last couple of years to try and engage folks who aren't going to be able to necessarily come to a city council meeting. 
But I do want to um, stress that if you want the decision makers to hear directly from you, they're very interested in hearing directly from you. And you can do that in a number of different ways. You can either email us and we'll get those into the staff reports, uh, or you can come to a meeting like this we'll, you know, where it's recorded, your, your voice will be heard. Um, or you can come to those city council and planning commission meetings, speak directly to them. Okay, just real quick to acknowledge, uh, we're working with Plan West Partners, uh, Ben Noble Consulting and GHD to bring this uh, plan to the community, as well as some updates to the general plan, all of which will be uh, taken together to city council for consideration for adoption sometime late next year. Just before we get into the plan though, I wanna orient you to our planning page. This is the landing page for the city of Arcata, cityofarcata.org. Currently right now under news and announcements, you'll see the Arcata Gateway Area Plan. If you follow that link, you'll get to the same page um, that will uh, provide you a copy of the draft, which you can download, um, and a 60 minute in-depth informational video uh, reviewing all You muted yourself, David. I realize that, thank you. I didn't want anybody to listen to me clear my throat. That's the nice thing about Zoom is that you don't have to listen to me clear my throat. Um, okay, so just getting into it. Here's the uh, cover of the gateway area plan, uh, currently in draft form. We're gonna dig into this in a little more detail. And basically the way we're gonna go through it is as if you were flipping through the document. I'm gonna key you into a couple of the highlights of the document starting out with some of the, the, the terms. You'll hear me use this term gateway in a lot of different ways today. Uh, the gateway area plan is the plan the, um, that we're reviewing tonight. The gateway, um, it's listed as area code here. It's actually the gateway zoning code um, that, that will be amended, is the uh, nuts and bolts regulation that will implement this plan um, once it's adopted. The gateway plan area is the area outlined in yellow here on the facing map, and we'll walk through that in a little bit more detail. And then within that gateway area, there are sub areas, and we'll get into detail on differences between those sub areas momentarily. So looking at this, uh, orienting it so it's a little more palatable for us to view, uh, I wanted to point out that part of the gateway area is in the coastal zone, this blue dotted line that you see going through the center represents the coastal zone. Everything south of that is in the coastal zone and everything north of it is outside the coastal zone. Uh, some of you are very familiar with the area and may understand these boundaries real clearly, but for those who uh, want a refresher, there's the plaza and the creamery building. Uh, it's bordered by Samoa. K Street runs right through the core, uh, core of it uh, and turns into Alliance. Looking from this arrow here, uh, we can look down on the area, see Arcata Bay, the creamery, plaza, Alliance, K Street and Samoa Boulevard, those are our boundaries. And so this is the area that this plan affects. Uh, it's specifically intended to address uh, policy and implementation to enhance infill development in just this area. It doesn't apply to areas outside of this that are in the city. This area represents a total of about 64 city blocks. Starting at the north end uh, on Alliance here, we have the uh, mini storage, um, the, uh, the auto shop, uh, traveling down Alliance, and then looking back, turning around, looking back the way we just came. There's some auto shops off to the left, uh, houses to the right that are outside the district. Uh, and you can see in the foreground some, uh, some multifamily housing. Uh, the old Patriot gas station is in, but not much else on that side of the street is. But this area at K and 11th uh, is, is also in. Uh, we have some historic resources like the Portuguese Hall and others. Um, we have lots of businesses that are operating in the district, including Anthony Kahn shop, uh, other historic resources like the Lord House, uh, the Arcata Car Wash, which is another interesting property. That entire block is in one ownership as the car wash on one end, <clears throat> the uh, creek, which is daylighted through a portion of it in the middle, and then this mini storage uh, on the back side of it. Of course, there's the Creamery building, the heart of the Creamery district, uh, and the inspiration for this plan. Uh, that's along L Street. A lot of these uh, buildings are uh, older and have been uh, invested in, rehabilitated. 
a lot of investment gone in. The Redwood Coast Montessori operates out of the Tin Pin Building, which has had a major renovation over the time. And there are other sites like the Arcala Trader, Trailer Court um, that are uh, also in, but like the Merigas, reflect a little uh, lower level of investment, maybe um, you know legacy uses. Bud's Mini Storage is getting close to Samoa, where we end our southern journey to the uh, Winkle and Floyd Business Park, home of Wing and several other, other small businesses. I wanted to pause here for a moment uh, and just reflect on some of the concerns that we've been hearing uh, come back out of the community. We've heard a lot of people say, hey, this plan's being adopted. They're forcing us out of this area. Did you hear they're getting, you know, I'm not going to be able to live in this, uh, you know, my house anymore, or they're running these businesses out of town. And I just want to be real clear, there's nothing in this plan that forces anyone to move. There's nothing in this plan that forces anyone to stop doing what they're doing. All of the existing uses are considered existing non-conforming and they're compatible with the district and can continue. So that's the plan area. It's the area affected by this plan and it's the area that we're looking to try and increase uh, uh, infill development within. You'll notice a lot of that area has <clears throat> legacy and, and uh, near blight conditions, but a lot of the sites within that area, um, you know, have a lot of uh, pride of ownership and re recent investment. Let's just take a look at the broader context of the gateway area. What's within walking distance of this area? We did buffers, a uh, five minute and 10 minute walk from the boundary. You'll note there are businesses like Cypress Grove, uh, there's like Kiata High School. It's real close to the downtown, the North Town area, all within walking distance, walking distance of the border of Humboldt State University. So it's centrally located. In effect, it's uh, you know as prime a location as the downtown area is. Right now it's all zoned for industrial uses. And so this plan would change that underlying zoning to allow for, uh, you know, additional residential uses and mixed uses. Before we get into it, before we get to the detail of the plan, a couple of big things have come up that I wanted to address right in the front. What about tsunami hazard areas? Well, the pro project area is located close to the bay. Uh, the yellow is the mapped tsunami inundation zone. And our boundary is shown here. There's one area that's actually located in a, uh, a creek bed that is uh, at significantly lower elevation than the surrounding uh, streets and development uh, that is in that mapped inundation zone. But for the most part, it is not within the tsunami inundation zone as currently mapped. That's not to say that you're not going to have hazards that we have to address in the development of this plan. And it's not to say that the tsunami hazard inundation zone won't change as sea level rise changes. Sea level rise is another significant concern that people have had. Well, why are you building so close to the bay? Again, looking at that and a sea level rise viewer that's put out by uh, NOAA, looking at the current mean high, high water level, uh, the green area, the pixelated green area shows the, the inundation footprint. And if you go to the extreme end, uh, you know, out to approximately 2100, when sea level rise is anticipated to be nine feet higher than it is now, certainly there are some low-lying impacts to the area. Um, and this is if we do absolutely nothing to address the uh, the uh, landward march of the waters. So city is also working on uh, sea level rise adaptation strategy uh, concurrently with this plan. I encourage you to get involved in that if this is a issue that you're passionate about as well. Certainly in the future, we will have to address uh, living with water. Um, but before we leave this topic, I also wanted to point out that there are hundreds of homes uh, south of Samoa on G and H streets, South G and H street. Uh, on F Street, many homes located there that if uh, we keep going in the direction we're going with climate change and sea level rise, those homes at some point uh, will no longer be habitable. And so part of this plan is actually uh, a sea level rise adaptation strategy to ensure that there are areas for uh, for Arcata residents to, to move into our, you know, Arcata. Okay, so getting back to the gateway area plan. What is an area plan? Why call it the gateway area? And why create a plan for the gateway? 
So the area plan is basically an element of the general plan. It's going to lay out the policy and implementation to uh, create the Arcata that we want to see. We call it the gateway area. It's just a nickname we picked up because with the extension of Foster, uh, K Street became de facto a gateway into the city and main arterial, a way that many people went. Um, it still reflects the sort of legacy uses that were developed back in the you know, uh, 50s and 60s. Uh, and this plan will refresh and update it. Why are we creating the gateway plan? Well, at the most basic level, we said we would in the housing element. The state said, you have to create so many houses. We said, we don't have enough property to create that many houses. They said, well, you have to rezone some property so that you can create that many houses. So this is in part an effort to plan for the housing element for our current cycle, but it's also a long range planning effort. Uh, the first long range milestone that we're looking for is the next 20 year house, uh, general plan cycle. Uh, but we're also looking further out to, um, you know, plan for development into the future um, because this whole area will not be built out to maximum densities uh, over the lifetime of the plan. Okay, so just Again, back to the Strategic Infill Redevelopment Program page. If you query SIRP, S-I-R-P, and Arcata, this is the page you land on. This is a great page to learn about what's going on and to stay involved. If you follow the Get Involved tab, you'll have all kinds of options for coming to meetings like these. So this has been going on um, for approximately five years, this, this plan, planning process. Uh, started with development of, you know, conceptual uh, information that we got mostly out of the, the village um, project review, where the community really said, hey, we want to have a chance to do community design at the beginning instead of waiting until the project level. So we're doing community design right now. We uh, brought that concept forward into the housing element, and the housing element is the city's document that says how it's going to meet its housing objectives. And the state said, okay, we'll certify your housing element if you put this in. And the city council directed us to include that. We next did an infill market study to try and identify what kinds of development would actually pencil, what would be feasible. Um, if we produce a plan that makes it so that the only thing you can build is something that no one's ever going to build, then it's not much of a plan. It's not going to get back to the community. And so all of those processes involved tons of public engagement, stakeholder meetings, meetings like this, open to the public. Uh, luckily, we were meeting in person back then. But I want to emphasize, just because we have five years of history to develop these concepts and bring this plan to you does not mean that it's set in stone. This is another fear and concern that I've heard from people is that, hey, this plan's already done. It's not done. We're initiating the engagement now. The council wants to hear from you. They want to hear what your thoughts are about what we proposed. And if you have new ideas to incorporate, ultimately the council is going to need to balance the, the priorities. Uh, an example of that is uh, many people are concerned about the um, reduction in parking that's proposed in the plan. And we always kind of reflect on the fact that parking versus housing is a trade-off. Do you want to produce a place for a car to sit overnight, or do you want to produce a place for a family to sit overnight? And those are the trade-offs that we need to consider as we're going forward through this plan. So again, this was adopted in 2019, and it said, hey, do this gateway area specific plan. So that was part of how we got to where we are today. Right at the beginning of the document, we have the people's summary. This summarizes the entire document, just two pages. Uh, if you, you have just a brief amount of time, you want to familiarize yourself. Uh, this kind of lays out the high level objectives of the plan. And then we start digging into the detail. Uh, administration and context gets into locations, the document purpose, how it fits within the regulatory framework. This is an element of the general plan. You see the gateway area plan here. It's part of the general plan. There's a gateway zoning code that's yet to be developed. Once we get input on this gateway area plan, council feels confident that they can say, yes, now go build a, a zoning code based on this. We'll then shift into high gear on that and bring that to you later. Um, there are also many other documents. I mentioned that there's a coastal zone. So this uh, gateway area plan ultimately will be adopted as part of a local coastal program amendment. Um, there are policies that are in the general plan that are still going to apply in this area. So there's some policy balancing there. Um, but the land use code uh, sections that currently regulate 
uh, land use and development in the zone will be replaced with the gateway zoning code. Uh, and then elements that are left out of the gateway zoning code, for example, subdivision standards, will still have to look to the land use code. So there's a whole constellation of documents that we'll need to use to regulate development in the zone. The next thing we wanted to do in this plan was to really identify, well, what are the challenges and opportunities uh, that the city is facing that this area might be able to support? So just zooming in on those real quickly, um, you know, housing was really the impetus for this. Uh, the city has, for this uh, current housing element cycle, about 230 housing units left um, in terms of land zone for residential uses. And the city's obligation was 610 units. And so that was, a, you know, kind of past the, the red line critical need to develop new lands for housing. And in fact, it was originally called the, the housing infill plan. Uh, but we also wanted to address many of these other issues. Uh, racial equity and social justice are very important to the city of Arcata. We're ensuring that this plan reflects um, community based on uh, racial equity. Uh, we want to recognize the market constraints, but at the same time, we want to make sure that we manage growth appropriately. We identify climate change sustainability goals in this. And in fact, the countywide climate action plan points to plans like this as an implementation measure. In addition, there's sort of an unfulfilled identity in the zone uh, due largely just to uh, legacy uses and um, you know, not having a consolidated vision. You see areas like the Creamery District right around the Creamery Building where the, the local businesses and landowners you know, got together and really did something great. We'd love to be able to springboard on that and leverage that, create you know, that unfulfilled identity in the rest of the district. In addition, this will provide you know, jobs and opportunity, uh, entrepreneurial opportunities, and it's an opportunity to enhance our infrastructure. So those are sort of the core challenges and opportunities. Digging into them in a little bit more detail, you know, housing needs. Uh, we currently have an inadequate supply of housing at all income levels. A lot of the housing that's been built in the city uh, over the last 10 years has been uh, only a restricted affordable housing projects for very low income people. The projections indicate that the shortage is going to increase because of in migration related to folks running away from, you know, COVID, climate change, uh, economic displacement, all kinds of things. This is an ideal area. Uh, the HSU Polytechnic is obviously going to compound the problem of housing. And uh, this is another place I want to pause for a moment because some people have said, well, the city's just being reactionary to this whole polytech thing. In fact, we've been working on this because we've seen this uh, challenge coming forward for the last five years. It's not a response to the polytech, but it does assist with that. And Arcata truly has a limited amount of developable land that's zoned appropriately for housing. So one of the challenges that we've been struggling with is do we, you know, build low at lower densities and expand out the farmlands or do we, you know, double down on densities and make sure that we can preserve and protect the green spaces around us. And as mentioned before, it's optimally located. Racial equity, what are we doing? Well, you know, the uh, Arcata is trying to do its part to remedy the national legacy of racial injustice. It's clear that race is a determinant of several quality of life indicators, even though it shouldn't be. Everyone should have the same opportunities and have the same outcomes regardless of the color of their skin. But that's not the way that this world works right now. And the city has the opportunity to stimulate, stimulate development designed to ensure that race is not the law, no longer a determinant of life outcomes. So we are committed to racial equity. We're working with uh, many different uh, partners in this field, including a special stakeholder group uh, specifically addressing racial equity and social justice. Market constraints, significant challenges there. Cost of uh, developing housing is at an all time high. I recently sat on a housing panel and the developer sitting next to me said that without the subsidies they're getting from uh, you know, the state, the tax credits, they just couldn't build uh, housing and make money on it. Uh, and if they can't make money on it, they can't employ people. If they can't employ people, then they're not building housing. So it's really hard to make market rate housing pencil right now. Uh, part of that is related to the challenges of zoning, but part of that is related to market conditions we can't affect. We're looking to remedy some of those, and uh, we see some changes in the building code coming down the pike that will sort of shift gears on that as well. So this is one of the key challenges. Even though infill and high density are called for in existing planning documents, uh, translating that housing need through the planning process has presented significant challenges. 
I won't name names, but you can probably think of a few. Growth management. Uh, Gateway area has many vacant and underutilized parcels that we can take advantage of through this plan. Uh, and the very low density uses dominate larger areas, making higher density infill redevelopment a viable option. There's lots of space in the district, but I want to temper your reaction to, wait a minute, you're gonna fill all the space up with buildings? With the answer, no, we're not gonna fill up all the spaces with buildings. There's lots of other things in this plan that create a high quality environment for the people who live and, and work here. And then additionally, back to this idea of preserving open space, Everyone would agree with this value. I get it, the devil is in the details of how we uh, accomplish meeting this value, but this is a proposed solution in this plan, this draft plan tonight. We'd really like to get your feedback on it. So climate change and sustainability is clearly an issue that affects all of us. Uh, you know, development does come with environmental costs, there's no question about it, but we believe that new development can be expected to perform at a higher level of environmental sustainability. Back to that point that the Climate Action Plan is pointing us towards plans like this. We're actually, by doing this plan, helping to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. This area is intended to be a... Um, Oh, wow, five minutes remaining. I'm getting the hook here, people. Plan is intended to be a uh, you know refuge for climate change. So you know, related to the unfilled identity, I wanted to you know just go back to this idea that we're springboarding on the opportunities that uh, that the the leadership in the Kroo Marie District showed us are there. Um, we're emphasizing that and trying to boost that. It's also gonna be a great area for existing businesses. They can retain their business there. They're gonna see more people living around there and new synergies to address uh, you know, business development. Infrastructure, circulation, and parking are huge. We've heard a lot about this uh, in our uh, work to date, and we'll get into detail on that infrastructure in just a moment. So the gateway area vision statement, um, I'm not gonna read this whole thing to you. It's in the book, you can read it for yourself, but the tagline for this is to grow opportunity and build community equitably. That's what we're trying to do with this document. That's the feedback we'd love to get from you today is how we can do that together. The intent is to come up with mixed use, mixed tenure, high density, mixed income, thoughtfully designed, pedestrian friendly, community facing, sustainable and equitable development. Next in the document, we go through several images that are intended to provide some inspiration for what buildings and out, outdoor open spaces could look like, how building setbacks can affect the, uh, the feel and look of buildings, how you can design in quality uh, open space amenities. And so, you know, we can have deeper conversations in the breakout rooms about uh, those design elements, but the intent is behind this document is to show ahead of time to developers what we'd like to see in our community. Key opportunity sites. Again, pausing for a moment here. This map has been shown um, uh, for you know about a week now, and some people have looked at this and said, "What? There's going to be eight-story buildings on all of these parcels?" No, there isn't. We'll get into that in just a minute. But what I did want to say about this is that we've identified these as sites that can provide either high-quality development or high-quality outdoor open space, or both. And so each of these sites is listed along with. Uh, site letter telling you which one we're talking about. This one is K, K is down here. Gives you some information about how big it is, how many parcels there are, what's on it currently and what the opportunities are. Looking at a range of residential capacity and other potential uses of those sites. So that's a really important area to look and see like, well, what's, what is this document really proposing happen over time? Again, the total uh, build out would be around 3,000 3,500 is the max we're planning for. Okay, so to address, well, where, where, what's happening where? We have these five different districts, the Barrel District, the Gateway Hub, Gateway Corridor, Gateway Neighborhood. Um, I'm sorry, four districts. There are other designations like Natural Resource and et cetera, but those aren't uh, important to this discussion. Each of these different districts has different design standards, different building height standards, different setback requirements, different mix of use requirements. So let's just go through them. Gateway Barrel District is the southernmost area here. Uh, it's pretty vacant land for the most part uh, and can, uh, can handle fairly heavy density uh, without impacting other areas. And so this is where the highest density is proposed. 
the Gateway Hub is, includes the Creamery District, the Creamery Building, and areas outlying. There's lots of opportunity in this area as well, but uh, lesser densities, lower heights are allowed. Uh, the Gateway Corridor, we anticipate a mix of residential and commercial uses, and then the neighborhood is the transition area to ensure that smaller stature buildings uh, butt up against existing residential uses. Next chap chapter gets into land use. Again, the tables tell you the anticipated floor areas of different uses, the amounts in these different districts with a total of 3,500 units maximum over time. Uh, the policies are next, and this is the same for each of these different chapters. If they get into a policy and have uh, high level aspirational ideas, apply form-based design standards that allow high density multi-story buildings while simultaneously requiring a vibrant community-oriented street-facing built environment designed to fit a human-centered scale. We have some implementation measures that help us to implement those, it tells us to adopt a gateway zoning code uh, that would come next and that would actually put the nuts and bolts behind this program. Each of the chapters is set up like this where there's a vision, policies, and then um, some implementation measures. I do want to take just a moment to talk community benefits. I understand I'm running low on time here, uh, but this is one of the core features of the plan. Uh, typical planning process, you go to the planning commission, you get conditions of approval, we pick and choose on each project. Um, the idea here is to not lose those conditions of approval, those community amenities that we get through conditions of approval. The projects will have to give us conditions of, of approval through this amenity process. Um, and they range a whole bunch of different areas like housing creation, arts and culture, open space, green building and sustainability, et cetera. We'll talk more in the groups about what those communities amenities might look like. Okay, so just jumping to uh, what is the development going to look like? Uh, you've seen this page perhaps in the document, explains these different tiers, uh, shows you the various districts, and then it has a whole bunch of uh, you know different standards that are required or, or optional. So I just wanted to address real quick this uh, concern about eight-story buildings. It is true we have a proposal for eight-story building heights uh, in this district under the current, pr current proposal. But I also want to point out that this is only allowed under community benefits bonus tier four, so you would have to provide the most community benefits in order to get an eight-story building. You couldn't just build it by right. And it's not permitted in most of those sub-districts. It's only permitted in the barrel district. So eight-story buildings would only go in the barrel district if they provided a ton of community amenities. It's optional in that barrel district. <clears throat> going to bonus tier three, uh, you know, leaving off the bonus tier four in the gateway hub, you're allowed up to the bonus tier three, which would provide up to a seven-story building. And then getting into the corridor uh, that is sort of the commercial areas, you can only build up to a six story building under the current proposal. And the neighborhood is smaller stature, four and five story buildings. Now these aren't buildings that are just straight up in the air. I'm gonna skip through a little bit of this to make up some time, but basically there's a required setback from the sidewalk that'll be established in the zoning code, and there's uh, setbacks on the upper floors to preserve sunlight, uh, character, and um, you know other uh, aesthetic amenities, as well as to not make the buildings as oppressive as they would be otherwise. So, for example, to get to the first tier, you might have indoor park lockers, ground floor retail spaces to get to the second portable housing units, skip the third, and then the fourth tier would require something more. So that's kind of how the community benefits program would work. Excuse me as I zip through a few of these. It shows how the setback would assist with lighting on the street frontage. And that's really a cartoon version of uh, how it would work. Uh, and what we'd like to do, because it's a significant investment to translate this document into drawings of what uh, you know that would actually look like on the ground, 3D modeling of what that would look like on the ground, trying to get a sense from the community and ultimately direction from council uh, that, that before we pull the trigger and spend the big bucks to go into deeper design. Let's skip through a little bit of this. 
But the idea is that different levels of uh, community amenities would receive different levels of point totals and then buildings would have to or projects would have to meet a certain point total to receive that community amenity they'd be within these categories okay the next section is housing again they go through the policies and implementation measures the idea is to provide for mixed tenure range of units uh, in form-based code uh, we're looking to create employment, arts, culture, open space. Each of these has its own section. I wanted to focus just real quickly on open space and point out that there are multiple areas that are identified. And the detail here isn't important. What's important is that there are multiple areas that are identified for uh, open space, including uh, some linear features, such as you see on the north here. <clears throat> entire blocks of areas that would be privately owned but open to public uh, with new trails. Uh, the Barrel District would uh, have a plaza-sized uh, open space open to the public. And then everything within this red here, uh, we'd start designing out uh, private open space that's accessible to the public. Um, so projects that come forward, we'd look to partner with those landowners to ensure that there's uh, publicly accessible open space. Okay. I'm just gonna touch on mobility real quick because this is an important concept that I think a lot of people have come uh, and I realize I'm a little over time here and I will wrap it up quickly. Uh, mobility section deals with both uh, alternative transportation, bikes and ped facilities, as well as the uh, vehicular transportation. Looking first at cars, uh, the project proposes to extend uh, 8th and 9th streets as one-way couplets, extending the 8th and 9th street one-way couplet that is in the, uh, the downtown area, and then create a new uh, improved couplet similar to GNH street uh, but with one way orientation on each one. So right now, uh, one way, one lane orientation on each side. Right now, GNH Street, you can drive each direction one way. 8th and 9th Street in the downtown, it's one direction each way. What G Street, just a uh, street you're familiar with, looks like building frontage, sidewalk, there's a parking zone, uh, two drive lanes a bike lane, parking zone, sidewalk, and then the building frontage again. So you're familiar with this streetscape, um, and that'll help you envision what it's gonna look like, uh, but with improvements on 8th and 9th. Again, 8th and 9th will be one-way couplets continued. And a little bit of information about what that would look like is uh, something like this, where we'd have one-way couplets rounding about on N Street to get back on 8th Street East. Uh, importantly, the features are designed to improve pedestrian and bicycle access, wider sidewalks, segregated painted bike, I'm sorry, not segregated, but a painted bike lane, one lane of travel. Uh, the existing parking is replicated in a uh, angled end parking with some bump outs to provide for better pedestrian safety. This is replicated throughout the entire plan area, these kinds of improvements. What about K and L? K and L will translate in the plan to a one way north on K, one way south on L. But unlike G and H, K will be a one lane and so we'll L with a wide sidewalk, parking, a drive lane, a separated but not segregated bike lane, replacing the existing Shero and another sidewalk. Again, bumped out sidewalks to provide better uh, pedestrian access. Uh, this area is uh, st still a little bit in flux. We need to figure out how to accomplish the proposed um, uh, circulation here, there uh, will need to be acquisition through purchase of land with willing landowners in order to accomplish this. So the exact design is in flux, but we know that that's how we want to do it. 
What about getting from the downtown to this new district? It's a little quick walking tour down 9th Street, get to the stop sign, you want to cross the street, you look both ways, and you can cross at this crosswalk. Taking your chances a little bit though, uh, looking from this area here, the reason why I say you're taking your chances is because there are several different intersections with traffic. Uh, I believe the number was 32 total count. With this improved access, there'll be one lane of traffic going one direction, so a limit of four intersections with traffic. There'll be improved uh, crossings. And if you want to cross the street here, you'd have a shorter run to get across the street and only one way of traffic to worry about. And that gets you to the Creamery District. I am going to uh, hit the pause button real quick here and check in with the team. Because um, we do need to get into our breakout sessions. That's kind of a high level uh, review of most of what's being proposed here. Uh, L Street has a similar uh, um, uh, footprint with segregate, but the segregated bike lane will remain. Uh, there won't be just a painted stripe. It'll be the uh, the bike lane se segregated as you uh, as you see it. And then the plan also accounts for you know historic resources, uh, infrastructure and services, and etc. Okay. So that is the uh, presentation I had ready for you today. David, would you mind bringing up the um, the groups again with the yes, perfect. Um, I'd be happy to. So I think we had a fair amount of people join a little bit late. Uh, so as a refresher, if you have not yet chosen a group, uh, please do so now. All of our staff who will be able to answer questions uh, and discuss the plan with you will be in one of these four sessions. Uh, so we'll need you to uh, choose one. And um, I'll give you a few minutes to do that while I go through um, a couple of discussion guides uh, and then Crystal will begin to um, place you automatically based on which rooms still have capacity if you have not yet chosen uh, a group that you'd like to join. So I'm just going to um, ask David if you could leave this up so people can um, read it and I'll just verbally go through the discussion guides really briefly before we break. I know you're all here because you want to talk to us, you want to talk to each other. Um, so thank you for your patience and there is a lot of content to go through. Uh, if you did want more of a I detailed could. look at what the plan contains, please go to the website. We have an hour long okay. recording. Um, can I ask a question? Watch. We haven't been able to pick a, a group yet, and I'm not sure where that happens. Yeah, thank you, um, James. So you will pick a group by renaming yourself. So the way okay. you will um, do that is by going to your participant name, uh, going to rename, and choosing a number, one of the four groups that are here on your screen. Uh, if you would like to talk about how the housing growth and development, uh, pick number one if you'd like to talk about how to continue to um, make this a beautiful and livable part of town, choose community amenities, that's number two. If you would like to talk about uh, the roadway, the streetscape, um, transit and mobility, that would be group number three. If you'd like to talk about other elements of the plan uh, that David covered at the end, historic preservation, arts, park, land, and open space, choose group four. And you would be with Emily Sinkhorn and myself. Um, so I'll give you a few more minutes to choose your group uh, and Crystal will be assigning you. Uh, and we wanted to just ask as discussion guides, which are kind of similar to ground rules, but purely suggestions, um, is to attempt to share the speaking time with others. We're all here to collaborate and learn from one another uh, and share our thoughts and what is exciting to us, what resonates and what we have um, additional concerns about. 
Um, also, we are all here tonight because we uh, all want to preserve the things that we cherish about this community, and we all want to uh, be responsible to the future of generations on this land that we all occupy together. We're here um, with a good intent, and we are all here to learn from each other. Uh, that doesn't mean we necessarily have to agree on everything. We can reasonably have diverse and even divergent goals and strategies to achieve the needs uh, of this community into the future. And all of us are smarter than any of us, meaning we need to be here as a community um, doing these things together and having these conversations. And again, we just really appreciate that all of you are here with us tonight. So we're going to have uh, two groups. Uh, I think we're going to just stick with two based on our time and then bring it back to open it up for a broader discussion. It seems like that is of interest. Uh, we can open it up for more questions and answers. Um, and so what we're going to do is be popped into our breakout rooms. We're going to spend the majority of the time just talking about first impressions from participants. We don't have um, a super um, structured agenda. And then we'll also ask you um, to consider um, ensuring equitable opportunity and access for uh, current residents and future residents of this district. How do we make sure uh, that we are planning for any unintended repercussions of our planning that we can mitigate for now uh, by thinking of them early? So that is what I have for you. Um, I hope you all have great discussions in your rooms. And if you picked group four, I will see you there. Can I just ask you the time frame of how long for the groups and then when do you get to general Q&A? Yeah, we're going to be doing 20 minute sessions. So we'll be coming back uh, to do report outs from the sessions uh, a few minutes after seven, about 7.15. Thank you. Absolutely. All right, are we good to go? I think so. so. Yeah, let's do it. Here we go, opening up the rooms. Okay, thank you, Crystal. Welcome back, everyone. Yes, we've made it. We've made it through two sessions. And I know that probably there are many of us who have had very good conversations with each other, and there probably is still a lot more to say. So this will not be the last opportunity to uh, share with us, to share with each other. Uh, we will do what we can to um, make these meetings as fun and useful as possible. And next time, we'll have a chat. So I wanted to just do like 60 seconds per group of um, report outs. I'm going to start. We had uh, historic resources, parks and open space, um, and a couple of other things that I'm blanking on at this moment. But it was a very large, diverse uh, set of topics. Uh, a couple of things that came out of our group were consider we ought naming for some of our new parks and open spaces uh, to ensure historic uh, character is retained to the extent that we can uh, to protect not only the structures but also the context of those structures uh, to the extent that's feasible. And one member of our second group talked about um, looking to Emeryville as a town in California uh, that might have good inspiration for us. Uh, another good point that came up about recreation was if we're going to be having more uh, people, more families in this part of town, we should definitely make sure we do what we can to ensure um, families have safe access to the marsh across the Mole Boulevard and other parts of town uh, and encourage them to use those uh, recreational assets. Uh, another point that came up was encouraging native plants. Vine maples were specifically mentioned uh, and native trees. Uh, as well as just both an interest in seeing more trees and also concerns about ongoing maintenance of trees, which is something that we definitely uh, continue to work on and have heard before. So that's my very brief uh, report out of my group. Can I turn it over to Rosanna to report out for the circulation group? Yep. Sure. Thanks. Um, so for the first session, we had um, some questions and concerns about um, the purpose of the K&L Street one-way couplets. 
um, there was concerns and questions related to parking and the um, the railroad and um, the the bikeway along um, L Street and um, you know how that's going to uh, be maintained, um, especially with um, trees. So there was concerned about you know. Um, retaining trees and that uh, streetscape, the, not streetscape, the landscape um, in the in the green uh, space on the streets. Um, there was concerns and questions related to, looking at my notes here, um, people traveling possibly um, in the wrong directions on one-way streets. So just making sure that um, when it comes to the design that there's enough signage and, and stuff like that. Um, and then um, parking, as I mentioned before, um, in the second session, um, there was concern about the uh, cross section um, and if there's enough room on the road, um, which there, you know, everything will be fit into the existing uh, right away is um, the takeaway from that. And also, there was uh, expressed an appreciation for bike and ped friendly um, infrastructure and um, to see if we could add um, car sharing designated spaces in the beginning of that. Um, so, yeah, that's the, the takeaway. Okay, yeah, thank you, Rosanna. Gillen, would you mind reporting out for your group? Not at all. Hey, I'm Gillen. Um, Rob and I were speaking about community amenities. Um, our conversation went beyond that, and Rob did an excellent job of answering many points, but I'll focus on the community amenities. Um, so first off, uh, a resident who lives in one of the specific land use designation zones was wondering why their property area was zoned into Gateway Hub as opposed to Gateway Neighborhood or Gateway Barrel District. Um, and Rob answered that this is the time to reach out to the city if you have questions about your land use designation or would like to make a recommendation or request or uh, for further consideration there. That's the sort of thing that we'd like to hear during this time. Um, Another question was asked whether or not the community amenities uh, that will accompany new developments will be approved by city committees um, or and it was answered that they will be pre-approved. So as this plan continues to move forward, our committees will be setting standards and plans for those amenities um, before projects even come to us within the district. Um, and it was also noted there that uh, the point system we're using for community amenities is still in the works. So whether or not um, an electrical vehicle charging station is worth, say, one point or two for new development, um, those are the things we're still really seeking and wanting to hear, seeking input and wanting to hear from the community on at this point in time. So if you have um, ideas over what amenities would be ranked higher than others or should be, please reach out. Um, also there, it was noted that... Um, the, this plan has gone to six of our committees that ranked amenities already and gave their thoughts as, say, transportation or economic development, and those bodies have already ranked that. Uh, it was desired that that could be more fleshed out for the community as to how those committees ranked and why the order or sequence is the way it is right now, um, and just more opportunity for community conversation there. Um, a question was also asked about like existing infrastructure. So for example, uh, the fire department, if a building gets so tall that the fire department might need a new ladder, um, is the developer paying for that? And Rob answered that, yeah, if, um, if those, if there is a project or a group that is stimulating need for new infrastructure, then there will be a fair share way of doing that so that the project or developer who is requiring that new infrastructure for their project will be paying their fair share for the new city infrastructure. Um, another question was asked as to whether or not this will come with any additional property taxes or a special property tax district. This plan is not proposing anything along those lines. Um, and then there was some uh, questions about parking and mobility infrastructure, but I will leave those to Nitra. So thank you all and um, yeah, wonderful conversation. Okay, great. I think Vanessa, were you the reporter for yes. your group? Okay, great. And then yeah. we'll just transition uh, into wrapping up. So David and I were in housing, residential growth and land use options and um, a lot of really good discussion and points uh, were brought up you know, people seem to have reviewed a lot of the information. So we did get into a lot of specifics. They had a lot of specific questions. Um, 
also noting that, you know, housing is a primary importance to the community and a lot of employers looking to bring um, people into the community need places for their those people to live. Um, and that um, some good, some questions about the community benefits and amen amenities um, that those tables were in Rob's PowerPoint and have not been, are not specifically in the plan, will be in the code. So just kind of, you know, the best way to get those reviewed um, by the community and out there. And then an acknowledgement of, you know, infrastructure needs and, you know, what the city is doing to plan for that and how it's going to be paid for. Um, and, um, some comments about just, you know, hard to imagine seven and eight story buildings. And, but also, you know, there was an idea that some people would be interested in moving into higher density housing in Arcata. Um, and um, then there were a couple comments about property owners who, you know, how can they get help developing their property if they wanted to and what the, how the city can help them do that as private property owners. Um, and I think, David, I don't know if you have anything else to add, but that's a summary of, of what we talked about. Okay, it looks like David's saying, yep, that's, that's good. <laughs> Okay, so that is the close of our collaborative conversation. I'm going to turn it back over to David to bring up the final PowerPoint slides, which basically just say what our next steps are for engagement, and then we'll open it up for Q&A. We are at time, but I can stay. I feel like a lot of us um, on the city side are willing to stay to answer questions um, for at least, you know, a few minutes and iron out anything that came up. Maybe some of the facilitators had questions they didn't feel like they could answer. Um, so I, I'm going to turn it back over to David and then he can um, walk us through what our next steps are. All right. Hang tight. Technology is coming along here. OK. It I'll looks just leave this. really small. OK, now it looks normal. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Um, young people, they're just so anxious to get the, the things going here. <laughs> yeah, again. Before, before I uh, transition, you know, we, I'm going to leave this up for a little bit so you can take some of this information down and, and then Dila will close about what's coming up. Uh, but I do just wanted to thank um, all of you. It was a great discussion. I'm sorry we didn't get to more of the discussion. Definitely going to be um, more opportunities. And as Dilo said, uh, you know, we're happy to stick around for at least a few minutes if you want to chit chat and, and ask questions you didn't get asked before or ask questions about, a, uh, you know, one of the topics that you weren't able to get to before. Um, but just uh, uh, real quick, I, I wanted to kind of circle back around um, to this. I, the one thing I want you to leave with, the one thing I want you to walk out of here, you know, quote unquote, walk out of here uh, with the knowledge of is that we're um, really interested in hearing all perspectives. We're doing our best to reach out to as many different members of the community, many different stakeholders as possible. We want to hear from you. We want to hear your reflections on this plan and make this, uh, you know, the best plan that the city can for its, you know, growth and development over the, the next 20 years and to the long term. Um, again, in addition to the, you know, upcoming events that we have here, you know, staff, myself, Dilo, others on our team are more than happy to come and speak to your group. And so please do reach out to us. Uh, you can reach. Uh, us at this main link, comdev at cityofarcata.org, or you can find our uh, contact information online. Mine is d-l-o-y-a at cityofarcata.org. We all follow that same pattern, first initial, last name. Melinda, do you have a question? I do, thank you, David. My question is this, I, given these really wide ranging and very specific concerns raised in all of these groups, what is the rush to present this draft to council the end of December, which is likely the least attended council meeting of the year. 
what is the rush to bring it to council? Well, they are excited. <laughs> they want to see this plan. They want to ha have an opportunity to hear from all of you. Um, we want to get this thing kickstarted and have the community conversation. This is, uh, you know, uh, you know, I understand this is, you know, there's some things in here that maybe are very scary to certain people. And there's some things in here that are really, really exciting to certain people. And so um, I wouldn't characterize it as a rush so much as an excitement and enthusiasm. Um, the council, I just want to be clear with everyone on the call tonight, the council is not making a decision on this next Wednesday. They can't make a decision on this, even if they want to. Um, they can't adopt it. They can't implement it. There's no, nothing they can do because we haven't done the initial the, uh, environmental work yet. So they legally cannot take action on this. So we're not rushing it to the council after having one you know meeting with the public and then getting it adopted real quick. This is the very beginning of the next year long engagement uh, talking about this plan and other changes to the city that we'll be adopting through the general plan. Um, and we really encourage and, and uh, look forward to your participation in that. Okay. Um, Dila, did you have anything you wanted to say about this slide in particular before we transition to the q and I don't think that I do. I okay. think it's you're totally spot on with okay. that. I do know, though, because our chat had like a total attack. Um, Gillen had prepared some QR codes that people could access certain links to um, our frequently asked questions, uh, to our visioning survey, to the infill program page. So um, Gillen, would you be able to bring that up or send it to David so he could show it on, on the screen? David, you should have a PowerPoint slide in your email. I don't think I have the share screen power, but you do have a communication okay. from me. Great. Yeah, okay. it might be worth just having that pulled up while we answer questions, if you don't mind. Okay, I'm happy to do that. So we're uh, now officially in Q&A. We made it. <laughs> Let's figure it out for him. Uh, Aaron? Um, yeah, my question. He might have soon as up. So. I... Breaking up a little bit there. You want to try one more time? Was We're going to let you figure out your tech and jump to Jim real there quick. There we go. I got it back. Sorry. Okay. All right. So my uh, oh, okay. yeah, turn your phone after you. Um, so my question is, if you could just clarify. She's turning down her volume. Give me just a moment. Though. So my question is, can you clarify if at the point in time when the planning commission finally does present this to the city council, which could potentially happen in January if there's no further discussion? I was just wondering at that point in time, what does that represent exactly what it is that the council could possibly be adopting at that moment a draft to be moving forward with? Because there is that that actually occurs at that time. Yeah, at some point um, in this process, some point early in this process, um, the council is going to give us a uh, direction. Uh, you know, broad direction uh, on a pathway to start preparing a, um, a zoning ordinance based on. Uh, that doesn't mean that there couldn't be tweaks and changes over the course of the next year, but they will not be adopting it until uh, we get all of the changes associated with the general plan, this document, and then the new zoning code, which will happen sometime in late 2022. So we're gonna have several other opportunities to talk about this plan and the other plans that we're bringing forward between now and then. And I did have one other question though, David, is I know it from what I read in the Arcade I, I'm actually not the Arcade I, the Lost Coast Outpost, that at the time of the both the council and this coming, the 14th and the 15th, which will also be the planning commission, they will also be presenting the projects from Valley West the same night? Yes. Uh, 14th and 15th, the Planning Commission the City Council will evaluate the SP2 zone and the uh, permanent supportive housing projects. And do you feel there'll be enough time allotted for both the uh, areas to be covered, or should that be spread out over two meetings just to keep it fair for both projects? We're going to do our best to uh, keep it fair for both projects and evaluate them both, uh, you know, as introductory meetings for this material and as a, you know, public hearing for the other material. And if it seems like they haven't been completely addressed, will it possibly carry over, or the meeting might go longer? 
Uh, that's certainly the uh, the mayor's uh, up to the mayor's decision. Yeah, if they want to call the meeting and continue it, or if they want to, um, you know, continue it that night. Okay. Well, thank you. Appreciate it. Shift over to another. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. We'll try and clarify that on our web page as well as uh, through an e-notification. Um, Aaron, I think you were next. Yeah, I have a question about tweaks and changes. Um, so when it comes to tweaks and changes, um, mm -hmm. is, is so if, if the public has, uh, you know, thoughts for changes in the plan, um, and maybe even the council, you know, our elected representatives agree with some of our thoughts for changes in plans, but say planning doesn't, um, who, 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 uh, like what, what happens if, if we have an idea planning doesn't and community development does not want to incorporate our incorporate our idea, but, uh, like say a city city council values our changes. Like how does how does that uh, negotiation take place? Uh, if city staff does not want to make changes that the public want to want you to make changes, and even our elected representatives uh, back us on these changes, how does can what I, happens? Can, in can I can I jump in, Aaron, real quick? Because I think I understand yeah. the question. Um, we serve the public. We serve the community. We serve the community that's here now. And as a long range planning division, we serve the community that's yet to come. We serve at the pleasure of the council. We are directed by the council and the council works for the community. And so it's a community conversation. The council tells us, you know, make these tweaks and changes. We make the tweaks and changes. I want to be real clear that your uh, insights, uh, you collectively, not you just you, Aaron, but the insights that we've gathered here tonight are really important, but they're also only one of several uh, public meetings that we've held on this content, and they're only one of several public meetings that we'll hold on this gateway area plan. And so we're bringing all of the information that we hear from folks, and again, that policy balancing that I talked about at the beginning, the council will be doing that when they get into deliberations as to what actually to adopt. My hope is, is that over, over the course of the next couple of months, we'll be having this community conversation, you know, with the enthusiasm and the inspiration that we have right now to try and identify what are those key uh, tweaks and, and, and modifications that uh, will make this the best plan it can possibly be. So the cherry on top is the council directs staff. I want that to be real clear in everyone's minds. So there's a process the where they can, they can say, are the public's asking for this? And if the council uh, makes it a uh, priority, then city staff will make it a priority. Absolutely. And you can write letters to us. We will get them to the council. You can write letters directly or emails directly to the council. Uh, they'll hear you there. You should come to the meetings and tell them, um, you know, what you think um, directly. Uh, so there's lots of ways to get information about you know, your ideas and thoughts into this planning process. And we really encourage you to do that. Patricia, did you have a question? Um, yeah, I kind of wanted to go back to what Melinda brought up on um, kind of her comment of what's the rush. Um, putting two huge agendas um, up, up against, you know, up against each other, or not against each other, but in the same the meetings um, doesn't really do either one justice. And so if we've been planning or the city's been planning this for five years, I'm kind of with Melinda, like, why do we have to bring this, you know, vote for adopting the draft within this? They're not voting for, I just want to be real clear. They're not voting for adopting the draft. The council is not making a decision next Wednesday. Everybody yeah, should be perfectly clear on that. That's Wednesday, but within so, the next couple, uh, next couple meetings. Because I think they're gonna they're gonna vote to adopt the draft. It looks like maybe by the twenty. They, yeah. Okay, so I, I want to be clear to everyone in this room. Get, be real clear to everyone in this room. The council cannot adopt this draft. Cannot legally cannot adopt the draft until the environmental document is ready, completed, and certified. That's not going to happen for the next year. 
And so it won't be until late 2022 okay. at the very earliest any of this gets adopted. Okay. Well, Certainly the council is going to. Yeah, go ahead. I just, right. I want to clear up the misunderstanding because some people are no, thinking no, that we're adopting I, something. We're I not. I want to clarify it too because um, so, um, so the adoption of the draft are you talking about the adoption of the draft or the adoption of the plan? Um, so I know the adoption of the plan you have out in at the end of a year, but I was wondering about the adopt adoption of the draft. Well, the, the draft, okay, I, I see what you're saying. The draft doesn't technically get adopted, but the council is going to give us direction at some point to prepare a zoning code that's consistent with the draft. And so uh, at some point over the next several months, I don't know exactly when they're gonna give us that direction. There's gonna be plenty of opportunity for uh, public discourse in settings like this at planning commission meetings and city council meetings, study sessions. Um, and again, I'll come to your group. Um, I have uh, heard from the mayor that she's willing to meet with staff and community members and so if you have a desire to do that, reach out to me, we'll set something up. So you'll okay. have access to the, the process the whole way through. No, that, that clarifies it. Thank you. Thank you so much. Okay, great. Lizzie, did you have a question or a comment? Um, yeah, I just wanted to express um, a, the, the, a positive need that I've seen in the community in terms of people who are very desperate for housing. Um, and for myself, it took me around six months to secure our current rental, um, which is actually nice and clean, which is the first time I've lived in a nice, clean rental in Arcata. Um, so I, I would, I appreciate the efforts to address this problem. I do very serious. Um, and I see a number of people as I walk around sleeping in their cars, um, or like sleeping in doorways. And so I think that in the terms of the, what's the rush, you know, this, none of these projects are even like in the works. So it's still years away from any addressing of this need that is, I think, very immediate. Um, so I appreciate, you know, th the work of the city to try as, as, you know, efficiently as possible to address this stuff that I think is very important. So I feel lucky to be in a place, but I know not everyone is. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Melinda, did you have a follow-up? Uh, yeah, thank you. This is uh, actually Patrick. Melinda is, uh, did not drop her voice real quickly, um, but uh, she's my wife. And um, just a couple quick things. I think the confusion about going to the council had to do with the letter that we received. And I don't have it in front of me, but I do believe it said something about adopting the draft plan. And I think that's where the confusion is. But David, thank you for clarifying that. It's, I think, mm. clear that we're not heading that direction next week. Um, the point I wanted to make right okay. here, the point I want to make right here is that um, these QR codes are probably useful for just a fraction of our community here. Um, I know that I struggle with QR codes. I think I know what they are, but I don't know what to do with them. Um, and thank God. <laughs> I hear you. My wife is my IT person, so she can help me with that. Yeah. So if you can make this information accessible in some other format or many as many formats as you can, I think that'd be helpful. Absolutely, that's a really good point. That was, um, it's interesting you bring that up because that was the first thing that I thought when I, I was pulling this presentation up. All of this information is available on our SERP webpage. The simplest thing to do is to Google or whatever your favorite search engine is, SIRP and Arcata. It'll be the top hit. You click that link and all of this information is available on that web page. Um, the other important piece uh, that I don't want to leave without saying is uh, we have an e-notifications. I'll actually navigate you through it uh, in real time. Okay. Is that fast enough, Dilo? You're doing really good. You're doing great. I bet if you had Thank a QR you. code too, you would be like totally on top of it. Okay, sir. Arcata, Googled it. Bam, top hit. Strategic infill redevelopment program, all kinds of information there. I also wanted to point out that, you know, it brings up our uh, videos that we've produced as well. If you go to cityofarcata.org, 
uh, this e-notification sign-up link right here. You follow that, and that'll put you on, a, you can sign up for a listserv. You pop your email address in here, and then uh, click on this long-range planning and community visioning, and you'll get e-notifications about events like this. I'll look at that that letter. I'm sorry if, uh, if we weren't clear in that letter. Um, language is, um, unfortunately, our only tool to communicate. Uh, and it's really hard sometimes to, to get the message across. So we'll, we'll look back on that and try and put out a uh, correction. Uh, Magretta? Hi, thanks. Can you hear me? Yep. Okay, great. So um, I came up in some of the discussions and came up in a little gathering we had last night as well. Um, when the Monument Ridge wind power um, issue was being discussed and it just came to a head and the question um, for me right now is when we're talking especially about equity issues is um, has the WIAT community been um, invited or asked about um, this whole plan because uh, it is on unceded WIAT land uh, which is acknowledged by a lot of people so before we get to a situation where there's a lot of hostility in a big, huge public meeting um, between, you know, we are people and their supporters and um, others, you know, on an issue. What's the uh, history of discussion about this project with uh, the we are? Yeah, thanks for that. I don't have the, uh, you know, list of um, points of engagement with the we are right before me, but I can tell you that we collaborate early and often with the WIAT um, on this project. Um, and as, after the release, I made a specific outreach to all the TIPOs and several other tribal members and tribal chairs that um, that I have personal relationships with and let them know that the document was out and would be more than happy to host a meeting like this. Uh, in addition, we have we out representative on our uh, social, our racial equity and social work justice working group. And so, you know, certainly the we out are, um, you know, um, you know, involved, uh, welcomed, and um, we appreciate their their input and insights. Thanks for the question. Okay, Cindy, do you have you. A, a question? Yes, I do. Thank you. Um, what what do you see the time frame for this? Um, like how many units would you foresee being built in 10 years and how many of the 3,500 mm -hmm. units would you foresee in 20 years? I'm, I'm unclear as to the um, how this would progress. You know, that's that's a really good question. And I, I think I'd like to put together uh, a real detailed response um, and then send it out through that e-notifications and post it on our SERP page, because I think this is a big question for a lot of people. Um, I don't have specifics right now. I mean, a, a, a lot of this is really down to uh, what the market will bear. What I can tell you is this, is that we were looking at numbers, um, you know, for full build out and what that would mean for population growth uh, earlier today. And um, if, if we got the full build out in the 20 year time frame of the, the planning period for the document, that would be something like 49% growth, which we've never experienced ever in the history of Arcata. Um, I don't know if any community has ever experienced that kind of growth um, you know, here on the North Coast. Um, and certainly when we make a plan, the difference between the calculated build out uh, based on what the plan parameters are and the actual build out, you're always going to fall short without actual build out. Um, one of the discussion points that came up in our last meeting was uh, the fact that if you used our current zoning code and calculated build out of the area, um, uh, you know, or, or residential uses, you would easily end up with twice the amount of housing that we have now. But people have existing, um, you know, buildings on those properties. They have, you know, they're at lower densities that are allowed. Um, they're not going to just tear them down to rebuild them. And so some of it is market driven and some of it will be regulated ultimately by the maximum population density that we adopt into our general plan. But okay. I, I, I will put together a little bit more um, detailed and succinct uh, written answer to that question. And we'll put that out through our, uh, our SERP webpage. Okay. And um, I was going to ask, will you have like, people are moving in, will they be in their lease that they can't have cars? I mean, I walk religiously to work and there's only a mm -hmm. few of 
other people and I'm passed by a few bikes, but by far the majority of people are in their cars. I mean, people love their cars. How are you going to prevent cars um, being in that area that won't be able to serve parking? Yeah, it's a really good question. Um, there, the short answer is that their plan will have many different parking management strategies. Um, the plan will also have, uh, you know, provision for bike infrastructure, both on the public side and the private side. Um, in addition, there are other um, uh, programs that will look to improve alternative transportations like car share and, and bus system. Um, so a lot of that is built in. It's not going to happen overnight. And I, I fully expect that there are going to be growing pains uh, during the transition. Um, but and then and then I also want to emphasize that uh, some people have understood that this plan proposes for zero parking, and that that just isn't the case. There's uh, uh, certain provisions for parking in in various areas. They're at lower rates than one unit per, one parking space per unit generally, um, and there's also provisions for encouraging shared parking. But it is you know it is going to be. Um, uh, you know, a in part um, using the inconvenience of parking and driving uh, as a uh, management policy, a management practice to uh, shift people's uses over to other other types. We can dig into that in more detail. Um, I think it warrants having a, a special meeting just on the circulation parking uh, standards. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And did you have a comment or a question? Was that Anne or Aaron? I do. Can, can you hear me? Oh, I'm Anne. sorry, that was yeah. Anne. Yeah, can I can't. you hear Thank me? You. Yeah, I have a procedural yes. question, and that is you're saying that the city council at some point is going to direct you to begin the environmental impacts. And my question is, is this um, element may radically change. I mean, it, it may be that the city of Arcata or the people of Arcata decide to keep the general plan guidelines for height and keep it within three or four stories as opposed to eight? And how are you going to begin to evaluate environmental impacts when you don't know what the final plan is going to be? Frequently, that it seems to me you're going doing it concurrently, and I'm not sure how that's going to work. Yeah, it has to be done concurrently. And certainly, um, you know, uh, for, for those who kind of understand the CEQA parlance, this plan is, in effect, the project description. So we have to identify stable project description before we do the environmental analysis on it. And so what we're attempting to do with this plan at this point, this draft plan, is have this community conversation, settle on what the framework is going to look like generally, what we're hoping to target on the tail end of this. And so, you know, if that's not eight stories, but it's six, or if that's not six stories, but it's four, uh, that at some point the council has had enough interaction with the community to feel confident moving forward with the project description established in this draft plan. Once we get that direction, we'll start working on the zoning code that matches and implements, uh, you know, the draft that we're working on. Then we'll have two drafts. And then as we move through that process of collecting the rest of the, bar, the uh, general plan amendments that we propose and working through the, com the community process with that, We'll be developing the environmental analysis based on those draft documents as project descriptions. They have to be draft until the environmental document is adopted. Once that environmental document is certified, then the plan, the city council can start making decisions to adopt these documents. And so it's it's just necessary to to have a, a you know draft plan that we vetted that we then do the environmental analysis on. Thank you. Does that make sense? Yeah, it one, does. Thank you. One quick thing I would okay. maybe just um, like add to that too is we are looking at maximum impact. Um, and if things were to be scaled down, that likely would be the direction they'd go as opposed to scale up. So likely if impacts were to change, they would just be reduced <laughs> as it was scaled down um, negotiating, negotiating with the community. Yeah, that's, that's a good point. That's that's likely. I certainly don't want to, um, you know, have anyone 
um, think that we've had conversations with the council and we know that that's the direction they'd go, but it seems it seems like a reasonable bet. Colin, did you have a question? Um, just, just a brief, yeah, just a brief comment, really. Um, so, you know, I've reviewed the plan and um, as anybody who knows me won't be surprised, I, I have lots of specific comments, but I just in general, and, uh, you know, I said this in the circulation group, but I just wanted to say it again. I really think it's pretty clear the draft plan as it stands is the most bicycle and pedestrian friendly, uh, you know, land use plan that Humboldt County has ever seen. And I would, in my opinion, probably the most environmentally friendly. And I think that's something that we should be really proud of. And I hope that that's, you know, that, that character is retained as it goes through the process. So thank you. Thanks, Colin. Thanks. Um, Aaron, I'm going to skip over you and, and jump to Alex because you've already had a couple of opportunities. So I want to make sure that other people get a, a chance. So I, I keep thinking about the fact that no matter where, how tall the buildings are, we really need to put in a zip car uh, program where people can belong to that and they have access to cars when they need them. So I know people aren't going to probably give up ever going to Costco again, and maybe they don't have a vehicle, so they'd have to go in a taxi or they could take a zip car. And I think that's going to be a really important element to have within this whole planning process. It's a really good point, Alex. We um, do have provisions for, for car share. Um, I frankly think we're going to need to, you know, like many things we do up here on the North Coast, we're going to have to kind of homespun it. Um, it's a great uh, opportunity for for someone to you know develop a business model and implement this in rural jurisdictions. Um, I've been trying to get a hold of Zipcar for uh, about two years now to get uh, get their attention and tell them, hey, we're a growth market and you really need to look at us. And I'll continue to work on that because I think you're you're absolutely right. We need those uh, car share programs, um, and that may be something that we can you know continue to leverage with uh, with HSU as they grow to you know, have them use their connections with Zipcar to try and push that out into the community where their students are living. So uh, thanks for bringing well, that up. Well, they had two Zipcars up at Humboldt and then I noticed they both went away. So um, I'm just thinking that um, they must, someone must have a connection up there, but they haven't yeah. been there in a few years. Okay. Thank you. I think we're getting close to wrapping this up. So I just want to check in and see, does anybody have a, want to raise their hand and have a question? Otherwise we'll take Aaron, your last question, and then maybe we'll close up shop. All right. Does anybody else have a question? Yeah, I think uh, Chris has his hands up. There's a new person, Chris Richards. He was in our group and he was not able to speak. So I see his hand is raised. Chris Richards. I'm not seeing that. Oh, Chris. Oh, yeah. Okay. Thank you. It was blended in with the background. Yeah. Go ahead, Chris. Oh, yeah. Thanks for your efforts uh, on the front lines with this development. And, uh, you know, it's great that uh, we're finally getting to this stage where the public can be involved. And uh, I'd, I'd look for more avenues to help everybody in the community, the elderly you know, the computer illiterate and all of that to become aware and know about, you know, the opportunities and the disputes that are involved with this project. So, um, you know, I put I put some effort into this and uh, the, one of the biggest concerns I'm hearing on the street is the addressment of the infrastructure concerns as far as, uh, you know, fire department, electricity infrastructure, water concerns, all of, you know, the 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 increased traffic ways and, and the, you know, all of this stuff that's being promoted with this. And I, I, I would like to hear more about that, you know, in the in the coming time. And I know a lot of people are interested in how the timeline would correspond with the infrastructure growth, you know, as as the population grows. So uh, that's basically all I have for you tonight. But anyway, uh, again, I thank you. It, I know it's a, a huge project and there's a lot of dispute with, with it. So, yeah. Yeah, no, thank you for that. And I definitely, um, 
you know that is a you know big issue on everyone's mind. How do we how do we fund the infrastructure improvements? And we can, you know, I don't think there's time to go into depth about it now, but I think we can uh, you know address that in upcoming um, engagements. Um, Aaron, you want to one, one last time at the at bat, and and then we'll call it. All right, batter up. Um, so I was just hoping that um, that the Sorrel place uh, kind of being the guinea pig for for this kind of new model of uh, building with low uh, parking and maybe low car ownership. Um, I mean, that's what's projected. But say that doesn't happen. Are you guys going to be evaluating what happens with that and using that towards this plan over the coming whatever months or as it gets inhabited? Uh, just to see, uh, like, are people just driving around the blocks looking for parking? Like, is there somebody out there going to be watching how traffic patterns change, how parking patterns change with that development, and then using that info to guide you how uh, where you go with this plan with these with that theory of you know carless tenants? Um, you understand what I'm what I'm getting to? I think I do. Yeah. Yeah. And um, I don't think that's exactly how the traffic modeling will be uh, conducted uh, when we get to the point of doing the environmental analysis. And again, back to the, the points that were made about parking earlier, I, I you know, don't want to blow smoke uh, here. Uh, you know, it is there's definitely going to be a near term um, or at some point there's going to be a hinge point where, you know, we haven't created enough alternative transportation. Um, or it hasn't been well enough adopted, or the population is just such that they're not using it for whatever reason, and uh, you know the parking impacts will increase. I also want to emphasize again that um, this this plan doesn't call for zero parking, uh, so there is some parking, and there's a lot of improvements to the on-street parking. We don't have an analysis prepared right now that I can share with you, but um, uh, the on-street parking has, uh, you know, is is not significantly impacted, I believe, uh, by the plan proposal. But certainly, you know, there's going to be, um, you know, parking management strategies that we'll have to implement, you know, either parking permits or time parking or paid parking. Um, and those kinds of parking management and, and uh, transportation management um, methods help shift people's behaviors. Um, but I, I just want to be perfectly frank. I, I anticipate it to get less easy to find parking uh, as our community grows. But I also want to be real clear that it's going to get less easy to find parking, even if we don't plan for the growth, because the growth will happen regardless, maybe, you know, lesser, but the growth will happen. Um, growth finds a way. And so what we're trying to do with this, this planning effort is to plan for it, ensure that it grows in a way that doesn't have negative impacts uh, or is, reduces the in negative impacts to the community. So I think more on that, you know, it seems like a, a complete meeting on uh, circulation, transportation, parking, uh, and those issues is probably warranted at some point. With that, I really want to thank you all. Um, you know, this is, uh, you know, a lot of work. It's a lot of work for you. It's a lot of work for all of us. Um, you're volunteers. I recognize that. Um, and I really appreciate it. Um, you know, I think it takes all of these voices to, um, you know, to be heard, to, to make this plan what it's going to be. And um, really appreciate you coming out tonight. So with that, I think we will uh, sign off and feel free to reach out to us by email. We're happy to meet up with you uh, and your groups. Again, just throw that out there. Contact me, contact Elo. Thanks for coming. Good night, everyone.